have to do social skills because he needs to know what's an appropriate relationship. We've actually had this happen a, uh, probably at least 10 times mm -hmm. over the years with our autistic adolescents and young adults because as they become more aware socially, they kind of become aware of the opposite sex. There's a boy we're seeing now who was very nonverbal and started to get verbal and got his first girlfriend in like a high school program and told me her name and how he gave her a kiss in the middle of the program and the girl kind of moved away from him and so on and so forth. But it's improving the social skills, but uh, you know, the, the social interest, but now they need the social skills training. But let me show you what happened to his math. You see all this red at the beginning after the neurofeedback most of it was gone, especially the over-focusing. He was on 12-year training on antidepressant and Concerta. He got off all of his medications. His attention improved. Uh, the parents and teachers rated his behavior a lot better. He was mainstreamed in some regular classes and getting A's and B's. A lot of these kids are really bright, even though they're nonverbal. His scores on the IVA test from purple to yellow improved. They got higher. The parents and teachers rated his behavior problems lower from purple to yellow. Um, this is another boy that we saw. This is the one that was on the show. Uh, there was an NBC show a couple years ago called Autism, The Hidden Epidemic. They did a week-long series on autism in the first show Saturday night. We had a little segment on there. This was a more high-functioning autistic boy, or I might even might have even had some Asperger's. He was on three antidepressants when he came in. And when we finished the neurofeedback, he got off of them. That isn't so unusual because if you think about it, these medications really aren't for autism or Asperger's. So when these children are able to get off of them, they really weren't treating the really underlying disorder anyway. And his speeds improved, his scores improved. He was pretty high functioning. He was mainstream, his social skills improved. So he did really well. His IVA scores improved on those computer tests from purple to the green color. The parents and teachers rated his behavior symptoms less. Now, neurofeedback is not a simple thing, but unfortunately, there is no license to do it, although I'm on one of the boards of the National Biofeedback Society, and we're looking into that now. But somebody could go to a workshop in the weekend, buy equipment, and they could say they're a neurofeedback therapist. So you want to be careful. The people that really do this and are kind of experts at it, or nationally certified by a company called Biofeedback Certification Institute of America, BCIA. And they're usually psychologists or, you know, experienced mental health professionals. And make sure you're working with someone that has a lot of experience with ADD and autism and Asperger's, because there's 50 different types of neurofeedback. People are on medications. Some of them have had head injuries. Some of them have other things going on. So it, it, it's not an easy thing to do. I'm going to finish up by just showing you some of the studies. In ADHD, there's been about 30 studies. Every single study has had significant results. It started with Dr. Lubar, who, who was my mentor at the University of Tennessee. He actually just retired. He did 35 years of research. Um, we've had studies that compared medication and neurofeedback. On all those studies, you know, temporarily the medication group would look like it's doing as well as the neurofeedback. As we go through the research and they stop the treatments, the medication group results were off. The neurofeedback results w w continue. Dr. Manastri, who I present a lot with at conferences across the country, did a similar study with 100 children. They've also done study with fake or what's called placebo neurofeedback, which is really hard to do because after a while, especially kids with ADD, they figure out that it's fake and they, what they actually do is they take someone's brain waves and they feed them back at a different time than what they're doing. So it's your own brain waves but it doesn't match what you're doing. They found the same thing, the real neurofeedback worked and the kind of sham neurofeedback didn't. And there's been a, there was a new study that was just done this year. There's a lot of really good research. One of the best studies was done a couple years ago. Dr. Beauregard at University of Montreal did a new type of brain imaging called functional MRI. A functional MRI is kind of like a PET scan, and it shows, it actually can kind of show patterns of the neurotransmitters, the chemicals in the brain. The neurotransmitters are what medications improve. So they took a group of children with ADD, and they gave them Ritalin, and they saw that dopamine was improved, increased in a certain part of the brain. Then they had another group of students where they ran neurofeedback, and after the neurofeedback, they found the same pattern, the dopamine was increased in the same part of the brain as those kids who took Ritalin. 
but this was after they were done with the neurofeedback, where the group with Ritalin didn't show that pattern if they weren't on the Ritalin. So we're getting, and that kind of made sense because we knew we're seeing the brain waves change, but they measured how it increases neurotransmitters and dopamine in the brain. Our studies that we did in our clinic in the 90s, there was a group that got neurofeedback in green and a group in orange that didn't get any treatment. We measured IQ, both groups were average. The group that got the neurofeedback after 40 sessions, their IQs went up an average of 10 points. We've done two studies, found the same thing. This isn't unusual. It isn't like you get smarter, but when you pay attention better, you test better. We see this IQ changes 10 to 20 points from the neurofeedback. Other ADD treatments will sometimes have the same results. When we looked at how their attention problems were, the higher, the worse, the group that got the neurofeedback, their attention improved, it went down, and P is less than 0.05 when you do research. It's like a significant result. It means if you did the study 95, 100 times, 95 times you get the same result. Hyperactivity was a lot less. Way back in 1992 when I looked at this data, I looked at these students and their hyperactivity levels were normal. Their attention problems were normal. It didn't look like they had ADHD anymore. Their symptoms were resolved months after they stopped and that's what our goal was. It looked like they didn't have ADD or they were on medication when they weren't. And this is when we started to offer the clinical services and open our second office in Irvine and finally we opened the third office in North County. With autism, there's been about 14 studies. The best studies are the ones I listed. I'm going to go over two as we finish up. Um, Dr. Jaworzitz did a really good study in New Jersey, and Dr. Coben, who I wrote the review article with, has done some good studies. I mentioned him with the social skills improvement. Dr. Jaworzitz is a new uh, psychologist in New Jersey who has Asperger's, and she got interested because her two grandkids had uh, autism. And she had such phenomenal results with her study that the biggest school district in New Jersey for a couple years was offering their feedback to all the kids in the school district. That was before budget cuts and all the other things. So her quote was, and th these are for you know, kids that were a little older, that ABA took years to produce results with some of these kids and their feedback only took months. So she was very impressed with it. Uh, applied behavior analysis is the, the treatment that they do with a lot of younger kids that have, you know, w with autism. Now, Dr. Coben did this study two years ago, and this was what I was telling you earlier. It's called the benefit to harm ratio. They study different treatments with autism, and this is based on Bernie Rimland's research from San Diego. Um, what they do is they do different studies, and they say, okay, for every treatment, what, how many people get help versus how many people get side effects? So for students with autism who take a stimulant, one gets better for one that gets side effects. Not really that good. Risperdal, which is the medication that's approved for autism, three improve for one that has side effects. That's better. The gluten-free, casein-free diet, which some of you might be familiar with with autism, 20 to 1. So has more benefits than side effects. Neurofeedback was 91 to 1 in his studies because it didn't have side effects but it really could target all those different patterns. So this was very exciting a couple years ago that we realized this. The couple last slides I'm going to tell you about, people ask how often do you do the neurofeedback? The minimum is twice a week. Uh, most people during the school year might do it two to four times a week during after school on Saturdays. In the summer, which actually starts next week for us when all the kids are out of school, we have an accelerated intense summer program where the st students or anybody can do this up to six days a week. In June, you can come in after s in the afternoons, but in July and August, we open in the mornings, and students can come in three, four, five, even six times a week, and they can get most of it or all of it done in the summer. It works really well. We have college students that come in and do this, or people who don't have neurofeedback in the area come into the area. But even for people who live here, to do it in the morning is nice because you do it, you get it over with, and you can kind of have the rest of the day free. Well, what sort of duration? An hour and a half, two the hours? The sessions are 45 minutes long. That's so, what I wanted. Yes, yeah, so, so they're not that long. And with some of the autistic kids, we kind of have to start with half an hour, especially the younger kids, and work up to that. Now, we don't do this in isolation. W parenting skills, behavior modification is very important. We work with parents individually and sometimes at parenting classes and work on consistency and follow through and natural consequences and ignoring and all these techniques that we do. Well, a lot of times we work with parents separately because all parents 
have different skills and 